Seraphim 17 once again. This is my Bayonetta 2 Infinite Climax video walkthrough. This is Chapter 15, Sovereign Power. As you can see, we're in a crazy shmup section, and I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> oh, it must be said, folks. I think this is a really, really great part of the game. I think the shooting section this time makes Isla del Sol look like an embarrassment. It's fantastically checkpointed, it's much briefer, it's just a lot more fun. It's so much more fun. It works so... Oh, I can't even compliment this section enough. And you know the best part? If you wear the Star Fox costume during the sequence, there is a Star Fox Easter egg, which is literally... This game becomes Lilac Wars. That's how crazy it gets. It's just insane. But I'm just not very good at this section, truth be told. And it stems from a few things. I was trying to shoot and use Boulder at the same time, and I ended up getting kind of stunlocked by those enemies flying through me, because I wasn't killing them. Because I was trying to attack with Boulder while I was holding shoot, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, you have a choice here between guns, and you have a choice between blade. The blade is for close quarters, the guns is for distance. If you hold the gun, you'll have a charged shot, and it fires a bigger Wicked Weave. If you hold the sword, you'll charge Boulder's sword, and it'll do a big Wicked Weave. And it's kind of awesome. And we fight a couple of bosses like this one. This boss has the exact same moveset that he had from when we fought him previously, so you should know when to dodge and when to attack. On his ice breath, you can fire the ice cubes back at him. This is actually a really fun fight. I, I really enjoy this part. It's, it's hilarious, isn't it? That the guy who has this massive reverence for shooters, who wanted to put a shooter section in his game, a la you know, Hideki Kamiya, put one in that he even admits himself was way too long and a little bit indulgent. Yet yeah, Hashimoto, who's the director of this, Kamiya was only a supervisor and he did the story, ended up kind of honouring Kamiya, and maybe he really likes Afterburner as well, by putting this sequence in, but also making it significantly better. And, like a lot of people, you know, adore what Hideki Kamiya does, and... I am guilty of thinking the dude is awesome and a genius, but at the same time, he's not infallible, so it is interesting to see somebody do his kind of game design better, which I think is really interesting. Obviously it's all preference, you might prefer the Isla del Sol one, but I think the Isla del Sol is literally one of the worst parts of Bayonetta 1, and if it didn't exist, I would not lament it. I would not grieve, I would have none of it, but this is, is his name Valiance? I think his name is? This is the golden giant sworded fella that is one of the coolest looking enemies on the game. Parts of me wish he was used more often, but then I remember just how tricky he can be when you're fighting him as Bayonetta and you're not doing all the fancy stuff like we're doing now. But this is wait for attack, shoot while attack is happening and then hit him with a charged boulder attack. That is all I'm doing here folks. I have no idea if there's a more optimum way of doing this, but this seems to work a, a treat and it's a lot of fun. It looks great. Frame rate's great. So cool. You'll also notice my ship is exploding every time he attacks me. That is because I'm doing the bat within evade. <laughs> I'm evading as I take damage, so you see the damage, but it doesn't register because it cancels it, which is one of the coolest aspects of Bayonetta. And then demons come, and now I start to take damage because I thought that guy would die, and he didn't. One thing that is quite challenging here is judging the distance on Boulder's swipes. Not only are they kind of slow, but sometimes you'll miss when you, th you thought it would hit. And it's, it's just familiarity, it's just about learning as the resentment turns up. Oh, sorry, is that a resentment or is that a mal... Mal enchantment, I think that's what that dude was. These creatures we're killing are the hatreds, if they have scythes. These are the furies, they do the slow motion blob which apparently hit me just then. <laughs> and then I think these are just more Furies. And then another one of this guy, well, an enchantment. But it's just... Like, for an action game, to do such a, a crazy turn into a completely different genre, it's a pretty bold statement. I know at this point we're used to it because we've played Bayonetta 1, and we've played the wonderful 101, but can you imagine if any other game series did this? Because they never really do, they never just jump in the deep end of completely new and different mechanics. And I'm not asking them to, it'd just be nice to see what they would do in contrast. Because 
when you observe it, they generally do things at a much more laboured pace, much more, you know, laborious take on it. Like, Assassin's Creed had this established thing of doing all the miscellaneous tasks, then assassinating a dude, and they had a little bit of horse riding, and then they introduced this, like, macro-management of, of assassins and, and sending them out on missions, and then that gradually extended into the naval stuff, and then that gradually expanded into the naval contracts of sending them out to get, you know, supplies and things, and it's this logical evolution. Can you imagine if Assassin's Creed 2 had you doing all those things that it took Ubisoft like five games to do? <laughs> I think it'd be probably better received. Because they're wearing out the welcome with a lot of things like that. Like, Gears of War I always thought was interesting. Because the middle part of Gears of War has you driving a car. <laughs> and it's not the best car controls, and it's actually pretty tough if you've ever played it on, on the harder difficulties. And it comes out of nowhere, and you never do it again. But you will always remember it because you just didn't think it would do that. You spent the entire time essentially living behind a chest high wall shooting monsters. And then all of a sudden, you were doing this really strange surviving, get to the light, you know, stay out of the darkness tank mission. And that is by no means original or never been done before, but I always felt it was interesting for them to do that when you didn't expect it. And Call of Duty now has, has got to the point where. If you're not doing something different every level, a la in a jeep, in a car, on a bike, in a jet, underwater, in space, then it's not Call of Duty. And they've kind of gone the opposite way of, they think they're mixing it up, but they're really playing into the stereotype of, of course we were going to be on a turret, of course we were going to be on a rail section, of course we're on a snowmobile. And they've lost the allure of those moments. Whereas in a game like this, we've spent the entire game beating shit up in probably one of the most fun games where you can do that. And then randomly we were on the back of a horse and we were like, oh my god, this is so good! We're on a horse! It's crazy! And then we were back to beating people up for a while and then we were in that crazy flying tank witch armor and we flew and took down an armada and it all got crazy again. Like, oh my god, I'm in a tank! And then we were back again and then all of a sudden we were in a jet. And it's just that impeccable pacing and it's that gameplay that doesn't outlive its welcome because it's immaculately paced on this one. And I think it's a, a testament to just great game design. But this is the last boss. This is the Prophet, we fought him before. He doesn't change much. The only difference on Infinite Climax before what you fought him before is how quick his moves come out. Your first few attempts at this boss are going to be acclimatizing to just how fast he can ruin your face. And he gets faster and I didn't think it was possible. He also has some pretty damaging magic which you want to be careful of. As I've mentioned previously, you can shoot this guy indefinitely and keep your combo. My strategy is going to be quite safe, I'm going to use the chainsaws for damage, I'm going to use the whips if he gets out of the damage too much, and I'm going to constantly shoot him to keep the, ch keep the chain of combos, and I'm going to play it counter punchy. I'm not going to initiate, I'm going to counter punch. It's the best way to play Bayonetta I believe, unless you're XHL Gladiator who is possibly the best Bayonetta player that's alive. But counterpunch this boss, as soon as you get him down, he's going to go into his second phase, and that's when shit gets really interesting, because that's when people who thought their reflexes were good are suddenly going to feel like old men. <laughs> but he's got quite a few life bars. The cool thing is, this is all practicing for whenever you fight this enemy again, and for the final phase, because his pattern is almost the same, he just has more of the spammy, crazy, magical bullshit moves. And if you're wondering why I'm, a, I'm backing away when he does those, it's because they kept hitting me. I was getting close to them, I was avoiding them, and I was still taking damage because my evades weren't good enough. And instead, I thought I'll just back up, I'll take my time, and I'll fight him on my terms, and I had a lot more success. So that's the reason why I'm not being as aggressive as I normally would be. And that right there was a really bad spam evade. So I deserve to be punished. And the game obliged happily. But we're getting him down now to his, his final life bar. The less life he has, Chances are the more spammy he will be with the big moves. That was a, a right hook, apparently, I wasn't expecting. That move, spam the dodge so that you can get back with him when you recover. And I'm going to be saving my Umbra and Climax, because I thought I could save it for the end and I could make the final phase easier. Turns out Umbra and Climax really doesn't help in that last phase. It's kind of just really hard and really fast. But keep on narrowing him down, keep on beating him up. 
counter punch. Be aware that whenever he recovers, he can immediately go into that counter uh, double fisted palm slap thing. And it's so fast. But keep on beating him. Keep on hitting on him. And the life you have here, you will carry into the next section. Once again, the load times when you quit out and you reload this encounter are probably the longest in the game. It is easily about 30 to 40 seconds of loading, and I'm sorry, but that is completely unacceptable. There are moments on this game when it loads for 10 seconds, and that is amazing. A 40 second load on a boss that can hit me in a second across a 3 minute fight where I have to be perfect. Not happening. Anyhow, this is a seer. This is the final form of the boss. This is when things get really crazy. So in this phase, you, you actually have Boulder with you attacking the boss. And bless his heart, he tries his best to do damage, and he kind of does a pretty good job. It's not going to change your life, but he's useful. However, he makes the fight harder, because he diverts Asiya's attention. And when you do not know what this boss is attacking, and he decides to do his fast attacks, good luck. This creature moves so fast, it is insane. Like, some of the moves this guy can do are literally the fastest things I've ever seen in gaming. That move especially. There is so little wind up to it and it's on you immediately. And whenever he does his counter punch, it's another insanely quick one. Especially if you're in the middle of a combo and he just does it, it's super fast. We haven't seen anything too quick just yet, except for that laser that I dodged. So let's watch for it. There it was. You see that? <laughs> Thank goodness it missed me. Here he does calling in his crazy B-52 bomber things. All you have to do here is, is dodge the the predicted explosions and then you can move in and attack him if you get witch time. Strategy is the same. There it was again, that crazy counter move that's insanely fast. There it was again. <laughs> oh my goodness. And this guy's got like nine life bars too. That slows you down. If he's going to do a move like that, once again, get the bat within. Just always be aware, whenever he is being comboed, he can recover with that move. So, you almost are doing a disservice to yourself, or a disservice, sorry, because that's the correct way of saying that, if you don't dodge. Because the amount of times I've waited for him to act and then dodged, I've been hit. It almost feels like you have to preemptively dodge. As soon as you see him recover, he's attacking you. And I just think it's insanely fast. And then this is the third phase, and another checkpoint. The checkpoints on this fight are brilliant. The load times for this fight are not, and it's really sad for, for people who are going to be running rank, who aren't amazing players, who do everything in one attempt. But in this phase, he's going to start hitting us with satellites, and he's going to pretty much do everything he's done before. However, we can't bounce him now because we're in the air, technically, so I'm going to be doing a lot more of the chainsaw combos. So the best case scenario for this fight is when he's not spamming missiles like he's doing right now but when he's actually physically attacking you get your witch time start to combo he counterattacks you, you you combo him again all it should be if you can get him doing this is attack him dodge him attack him dodge him and chain him in this pattern of him reposting as he recovers so you can get more witch time However, he's going to do missiles, he's going to try and trap you in the, the electricity orb, he's going to do a lot of things, and then after a while, he'll summon this satellite that you have to do this with. I'm all for these sections being in the game, I just wish they weren't as similar to, to Bayonetta 1. The ones in Bayonetta 1 are some of the most fun moments of that game, and it kind of feels like they're just rehashing them instead of making them awesome. It's a very small complaint, but it's valid, I think. So, this is a great pattern so far. He dodged twice, now he's going to fire bullshit. Wait for the circle of blue around the satellite before you dodge. That signifies it's about to fire. He comes in with his really quick combo. That's his counter, that's what we want. God, it's so fast. It's wicked fast, that. <laughs> but we're using it to our advantage to win. And that's why this fight is really interesting. This can be difficult because it's got massive radius on it. However, we got the witch time. Here is more missiles. Wait for it and then evade, get the witch time, and then finish him off. Ooh, get the witch time again, and then there you go. So that is the end of the Aesir fight. There's going to be this really novelty sequence where we get to beat him up with no powers, which is kind of strange. And here it is. So he is completely vulnerable now to anything. You can do what you want. 
He will not fight back. This is the opportunity to style on his ear and finish him however you choose to. And now we get to do the end of the game. So father and daughter unite as one. They come together to make a crazy infernal angel and demon. Very similar to what happened at the end of Bayonetta 1. And I'm not too sure what this one is called. Uh, I don't think it's Madame Butterfly. So I think she has a special name. Because she looks like Jubileus. So she's some kind of crazy offbeat of that. And then we do the Infiniton. And she does a lovely double-footed drop kick, which <laughs> I'm always a fan of seeing. It reminds me of Vegeta. And then we get to guide good old Azir into the mouth of Jean's, or Jean's, Gamora. Who's probably got a different name, because you generally find the infernal demons for different characters have different names. And this is clearly a throwback to guiding Jubileus into the sun. Which was a pretty fun sequence. And I, I'm, I'm happy that this one doesn't have any fail states. Because hitting those planets on that moment... As funny as it was and as interesting as it could be, it kind of killed all the hype of it. That was if you weren't good enough to do it. And the amount of times I failed that is kind of embarrassing, but it is what it is, I guess. And that is the end of Bayonetta 2, guys. Thank you very much for watching. There's going to be plenty more content coming when I discover things and potentially uh, new fun runs. But for this moment in time, that is all. You take care now.